In his influential trilogy on the information age, Manuel Castells taught us in the early 2000s that what matters in the information age is not geographical structure, it's the space of flows, the space that emerges from the networked structure of digital networks. And that's very important and often to be forgotten when this digital network structure, which has a very different geography, meets the real world geography with all of its histories and path dependencies and its unfinished business of globalization. So in this last, the last lectures, I want to dive deeper a little bit on that because there's also something that's very uh, dear to my heart as, as somebody who has traveled uh, most of his life, actually. So because if you talk about the digital age, you hear often about this, and this is just one example in influential books from the early 2000s that has argued that the world is now flat thanks to digital communication. The world is connected uh, and is flat, well, pun intended there, because we globalized the flow of information. And it's truth, very certain. Information and digital networks travels at the speed of light, I mean, through fiber optic cables or through radio waves. And according to Einstein, nothing in this universe can travel faster than the speed of light, or that no information can travel faster than the speed of light. So we basically max that out, and that's how far we now a little planet, that's how far we can go. So there's a fair argument to be made that the globalization of information with digital net networks has been pretty much done. Well, of course, there's the digital divide, but also we talked about there that most people, the vast majority, 80% of people have a mobile phone, 90%, and usually when you reach 90%, often economists talk about universal access. So there's a fair argument to be made that the world is much flatter now when it comes to the globalization of information. Also, in parallel, what has happened in the last few decades is the globalization of goods and capital. And capital being flowing through digital networks as information, because finance is basically information, and goods also being facilitated. The transfer of goods being facilitated by digital networks, but not only. A lot of free trade agreements and a lot of international cooperation on trade has advanced the globalization of goods and capital. Now, what has not been globalized yet is the globalization of, of people, be that for private tourist visas that uh, are very much needed or, or labor, even more restricted, trying to get a labor visa, a green card here in the United States. So that has not been globalized. Also, we're meeting some historical inequalities. A lot of that goes actually back to colonialism and how the industrialization, the industrial age has developed and the inequalities it has created. And last but not least, also the global governance structure is, um, in the best case, we could say it's unfinished. It has a legislative and a judicial, but it never got around. It was planned, but it never got around to implement the executive. So when we then unleash something digital that inherently lives in the global space of flow, so when you publish a web page, it is inherently global, you will confront this kind of analog reality. So I want to extend myself a little bit and go deeper into this. So first of all, yes, very true. Information has been globalized thanks to the digital revolution. The world is much more flat in terms of information with all of its advantages and disadvantages. And there's a lot of cultural. So first of all, yes, information has been globalized for the better or worse. I mean, you can also offend a lot of people if automatically you send a lot of information there without respecting people's norms. And some countries, some regions try to create their firewalls and try to filter out. Maybe some images are, are permissible in some cultures and some not. And also this globalization of information comes with its challenges. But it's true that this has been globalized. And I think this has also been recognized in different cultures uh, working on that as, as good as they can, but you know, the genie here is pretty much technologically at least, um, has been unleashed and is out of the bottle. Uh, the same for goods and capitals as well. That has been worked on for many decades. This is not necessarily and automatically linked to the digital revolution. It has more to do with free trade agreements and with globalization, but social mobility has not been globalized. So while 
you hear about information wise what's going on in different parts and you can get good can get goods and capital from there you the physical body cannot go there now that's very different from the full amount of freedoms that are happening in a union for example in the united states or in the european union which is a union of different countries in the european union this is very explicit and it's part of its constitution so there are four different freedoms First of all, there's the freedom of movement of capital and of goods, and we have the same thing going on globally, but also there's the freedom of movement of services. So for example, if you are a hairdresser and you want to provide a service in another country in the European Union, you have the right to go there. Globally, you uh, you cannot, you cannot provide a service. And that actually also brings clarity in the digital age. It's, it's becoming tricky. Because services, a lot of services can be provided at a distance. And many freelancers, for example, become part of another economy. But this is not very clearly regulated. And the digital age has started to open this gate. But it's still more like a workaround than something that's officially recognized. And the last freedom that's established in the European Union, but is clearly not globalized, is the free movement of people. So you can transition from one country to another as being part of that union. Same as here in the United States, you can, trans you can go from one state to the other, and that is just your freedom globally we have not transitioned towards that. And this is actually nothing that we say like, oh, that just happened in the 20th century. No, if you go all the way back to Adam Smith, the kind of like godfather of the free market economy, Adam Smith was actually one of his biggest critiques was exactly about that. So he, when he wrote uh, The Wealth of Nations, he said, well, actually that's how the free market would work. And many free market economists nowadays or defenders of the free market cite Adam Smith, but Adam Smith actually talked about all four of these freedoms. What we have implemented now globally is the free market of goods and capital. Services, the digital age tries to make a crack in the hole, in, in the wall, but we have not yet globalized the free flow of labor. And let's just read Adam Smith directly and see what he says. He says, the policy of Europe back then, 1700 something, by not leaving things at perfect liberty, occasions other inequalities of much greater importance. It does this chiefly by restraining the competition beyond what naturally would be, by obstructing the free circulation of labor in stock, both from employment to employment and from place to place, which occasions in some cases a very inconvenient inequality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employment. So he said, you know, if you want to have free markets, for the math to work out of the market economy, you also have to make sure that the people with the right skills can get to the right jobs. Now, in our globalized world, we don't do that. We don't allow somebody from another country, like well, let's say from Africa to come here and compete for these jobs or from Asia coming to Europe or from South America, no. We say like, oh, free market of goods and capital, but labor, uh, uh, no. And that's actually a critique that's as old as the market model that Adam Smith introduced. And as I said, the digital economy kind of like makes a crack in the dam and water is starting to trickle through, for example, with these freelancer platforms. And some of them are bigger than the largest economies. I mean, there are millions of workers they are offering their services online. So we're starting to work on that, but that's not explicitly embraced. And I'm saying, uh, having doing policy in the digital age, you have to consider this transitionary phase that we're in, where we kind of like half globalized the market economy, because it's truth very certain that the tired and poor and huddled masses long time are not coming anymore. I mean, if you, if you have the money, Yes, you can buy yourself a visa from another country and that is well established and many countries offer that. But if not, then that's not permissible and that is a severe thing to consider when designing global digitalization strategies. Another characteristic of our unfinished business of globalization are the path dependencies that come from historical inequalities and they actually come from the Industrial Revolution. That's when they mainly have been created because the Industrial Revolution as well didn't come uniformly for like mana for heaven. It actually, you know, also diffused and it diffused 
starting with the countries that it came from, and then it propelled since it was the energy, the energy revolution created possibilities to you know reach out first with the water with the ships then with the steam engines with the trains and therefore led to centuries of colonization propelled by technological superiority in the industrial revolutions here you can see how actually colonialism evolved over over 500 years it first reached out to south america and then well some interest got lost in south america they got independent and then well it kept on going towards africa in the 1800s and and these uh, severe the aftermath of this inequality of the industrial re revolution can still be felt in the digital revolution for example you might say well one characteristic of, of colonialism was slavery, and that was horrible, but that was done. Well, is it really done? And how does that actually affect us nowadays? And it brings us back again to the question of humans in globalization and their role. So in the 1600s to the 1800s, a slave cost in today's money between $15,000 and $200,000. That was actually very expensive. So in average, let's say $40,000. That means you could get a good car for it. That's why only the super rich had slaves. Now, 10 million Africans arrived in the 17th to the 19th century. About 10 million Africans arrived in the US between the 17th and the 19th century. Well, you might say, well, that was back then. The slavery thing, that's basically done. I mean, that was horrible and bad, but what does it have to do with nowadays and with our modern period of globalization? Well, when I ask my colleagues who are working in the field of human trafficking, they actually say, well, a slave nowadays you can get for an average of $350, not $40,000, $350, debt bondage, forced labor, sex workers, and there are around 30 million people are living in is are estimated to live in illegal slave-like conditions. So maybe they come to a country, they're taking away their passport. They're certainly like it's slave-like conditions, costing about a fraction of what a slave actually cost back then, and many more people. So in that sense, now guess where they come from? Well, so there's a path dependency that has to be recognized that is still ongoing from previous technological revolutions. And that mainly, and that's where I want to start with it, mainly affects, again, humans and inequalities among humans. Now, this historical inequality does not only affect humans, but mainly, that's why I started with it. But it also, you can see that in the economy itself, because the industrial revolution still is still diffusing through the world system. This is some work uh, from my Chilean colleague, uh, Cesar Hidalgo, a uh, spectacular work on the product space. So basically what he showed here, the space of flows, if you conceptualize that in networks, you can see how different knowledge and industry actually diffuses in the economy. So you cannot just come from, I don't know, fishing and an oil-based economy, a resource-based economies that grows agriculture, fishing, oil and fruits, and jump over here to create electronics. You have to, first of all, climb the, the economy itself, the skills, the labors, the capital, the machinery of the economy has to migrate over there. And it goes through this network space of flows that's happening. Now, there's been a lot of work done that has shown that with different policies, especially trade policies, what developed countries have done is basically they've kicked away the ladder also with tariffs and others, and I don't have time to elaborate on that, but there's some reasonable arguments to be made that actually were also a lot of work done by Nobel Prize winners and other economies in international development that have critiqued a model that was going on in the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, where basically developed countries, with regard to trade policy especially, said, well, now we advance to a knowledge-based economy, and then they kicked away the ladder. And uh, the ladder that they climbed up in order to gain that knowledge, and with tariffs and with different trade agreements, basically didn't allow other economies to catch up. So there are some valid critiques I think from very well-known economists and scholars that say like, look, there's also an inequality here with regard to 
the knowledge, the skills that different regions of the world have in order to create new products. Now, the artificial intelligence paradigm, on the one hand, holds the promise that we can also, in developing countries, create, automate knowledge creation thanks to artificial intelligence. But then again, doing real artificial intelligence is extremely expensive. So most of the artificial intelligence is so expensive, it's only done in a very few resource-rich companies. So we still have to see, this is not played out yet, that promise. But all I want to say here is there's a, a severe inequality in knowledge in the economy. Now, third, you might say, okay, good, taking. There are historical inequalities and they go back to like inequalities between humans and inequalities between economic conditions, but also aren't developed countries sending a lot of aid, official development aid and support down to developing countries. And yes, you have to see there's a lot of grants that go from the most developed countries. That's the OECD, that's the rich club of the 40, 50 most industrialized countries that's being sent to the other 150 countries in the world. And you can see here, the official development assistance almost sum to 200 billion dollars. And you can see, especially here, as the COVID-19 pandemic uptick, you see a, a steep increase in official development system. Great, great, fantastic. And that is really to be applauded. So there's support being sent from the more industrialized country to developing countries. Now, is there also money flowing back? Well, if you see the debt service that is paid by developing countries, let's say from the South to the North, you can see actually this grand distribution it doesn't really matter. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. So it's $200 billion that, let's say, flow down and $1,500 billion that actually flow, flow upwards because of debt services I'm not an expert in, in exactly these, but I can look up these statistics and you just look it up. These are the debt services that's actually produced by the OECD. And you can see that's a difference of two and a half million dollars per minute. That's the delta. That's the difference of what, how much more the developing countries send to the developed countries than what goes in official development assistance down. And you can see the same thing in the digital age. So when there was the World Summit on the Information Society, as I already mentioned, I spent many weeks in Geneva and Tunis and I listened to these deliberations. And there was also the idea, shouldn't there be a global tax to close the digital divide? Shouldn't there be some kind of support that everybody in the world should have connectivity, a minimum connectivity? So we could just charge a few cents for every technological device that is sold and with that make sure that we buy connectivity for the poorest of the poor. It's called Global Digital Solidarity Fund. 1% of the public procurement contracts related to digital technology. That's all. And with that, you could have financed that everybody in the world is connected. That was back then. And then I looked it up a few years later in 2013 and the web page was closed. So that's how far that idea went. So the idea of support, of altruistic giving, of donations, of foundations is extremely important. All I wanted to show here is that we also, as I said, I mean, this, this analysis has been very crude and I probably get some critiques for it, but just look up the statistics and, and see if it's more than a drop in the bucket. I think it, it's important to realize that the previous technological revolution, the industrial revolution, has created some inequalities that we're still grappling with. And are we on the way to eradicate them? I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen data that convinces me that this is the case. And as long as there's no data, then we have to assume that, no, there is no catch up, actually. And while the digital revolution creates another inequality, the digital divide, we are still grappling with an increasing divide from previous technological revolutions. Last but not least, unleashing digital innovations globally also has to consider that there's actually no complete global governance structure that could you know, help to manage or withhold or to yeah, manage the change, the global change to begin with. So digital networks are inherently global and innovations like artificial intelligence very quickly spread all over the globe, the fastest diffusing innovations we've ever seen. But well, who is there 
Actually, I talk about social construction of technology. Who is, who is actually there? Where's the table we, we can all sit? Well, we have one. And I want to read the preamble because it's actually, it's quite emotional and the preamble of the charter of the United Nations. So the United Nations is the only table we have ever came up with where at least, well, all the recognized nations can meet. So at least there is a table. And we tried that two times. There was the League of Nations before that, after World War I, and that didn't really work out. It couldn't fulfill its mandate to prevent another world war. So after World War II, we tried again. And that's the first sentence of how that ambition started. It says, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind, we commit to, actually, and if you read the rest, it's the idea was to create a global governance structure that could prevent that from happening again. So we really tried hard and that's what we came up with. I mean, <laughs> look, I had to study that when I had to go through all my tests, you know, before, before they give a German lifelong global diplomatic immunity, they make him jump through many hoops. So I had to, you know, learn and study the entire structure a lot. And I eventually, yeah, I actually, it passed all of it. So about being very honest with you, even I still don't understand the structure of the global governance system that 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 we have created. So I'm trying to break it down in, in, in more digestible terms. So any governance structure, traditionally any state structure has famously three powers. There's the legislative that makes the laws. It says, like, okay, so what, what do we actually, what are the agreements, the norms we actually want to live by? Then, then there's the executive that executes these laws that also, at the end, also the military is in the executive and the government, actually, the government of turn is part of the executive. And then there's the judicial, the courts, that make sure that the executive actually also implements what the judicial, the judicial is the closest representative of the people in a democracy, what they lined out, what they agreed to do. And then there's the checks and balances between them. Yeah, I'm sure you remember all of it. So what do we have in the United Nations? Well, surely we have a legislative and we came up very quickly with that. First with the Declaration of Human Rights. So we were very good and we still very good. We write a lot of law. So there's the General Assembly and the General Assembly, everybody is there and we love to write laws. And we write a lot of them, a lot of agreements, a lot of on summits and a lot of judicial text that is then agreed on. And there we have it. It's amazing what you can write on paper. Now the judicial, we have an international court of justice in Den Haag. It has been operational and it has already also had some important trials, for example, for war crime criminals, but it's also, it has been also been questions when the biggest powers for example, get questioned by the International Court of Justice, just here also, our country, in the United States. And we are kind of like, yeah, really? Is that like, did we do something wrong or, or not? So the judicial power is there, but it is, it, it's not been going as well as the other two, but it's there. And that's a big achievement that we do have an in international court of justice in Den Haag. Now, what's with the executive power? What actually happened there? So the executive power would then say, like, we need somebody to also enforce all of that. So you would need a global, at the end, not only global, like, executive that can also have some administrative power and have some, push some rules through, put penalties out if you don't comply with it. But also, eventually, the issue is you need a global, well, a global police or a global military that makes sure that things, that's part of the executive, right? The head of the government is usually in countries also the head of the military because that's the same executive power. You can execute the law, being in checks and balances with the judicial force. So what happened? What happened with the global executive? Well, the idea at the beginning was to create one. All the countries got together and there was a lot of talking and they couldn't really agree on how to create the global military after World War II. So they eventually got to the conclusion that, look, like, I make it very simple right now. <laughs> they got to the conclusions like, look, there are five of us who have the potential to destroy the world. Five had the atomic bomb. That was the United States, Russia, China. Well, back then it was actually Taiwan, England, and France. And they said, well, if the five of us 
don't agree, then you know the world's gonna blow up. So instead of like 200 countries here talking, that's just about why do the five of us don't go in the basement and we first agree on ourselves how to do that? Because like you know, and while we do that, we all have a veto. Because like if we five don't agree, if one of us doesn't agree, I mean that gets pretty dangerous. So while we are there in the basement, we should have a veto power, right? So down there they went and the Cold War started and they're still sitting there. And that's what we call the security council. But that was never, that was never the idea that they would do that forever, right? There was just a transitional, temporary, quick fix solution to move a diplomatic process forward, but we never got out of it. So that means we never actually completed the vision. Now, there were several attempts, especially one, my personal hero, Kofi Annan, while I was at the United Nations, he actually pushed forward and, and tried to reform the Security Council. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. And, and there were several proposals to organize it by regions, for example, by organize it by world regions, or to add some other very influential, big, powerful countries, India, and what, well, then what happens with Pakistan or Brazil, what happens with Argentina, or an African, African country. So there were several proposals and we were pretty much good to go. But also then here in the United States, we couldn't, at the end, it was so close, but missed it. And that was extremely disappointing, I have to tell you. I, I, I remember it was extremely hard that this didn't work out. And here we are again, or still. And we do not have a global governance structure because basically we are missing an executive. That means we failed. There is no government, finished governance structure. But hopefully we can finish this up in order to fulfill the mission to prevent the scourge of war for another time to go. But we are still working on it. So summing up, yes, digital networks, there are some flatness, but there's also a lot of unflatness. So information, yes, has been pretty much globalized despite firewalls here and there, but in, you know, in general, yes, information flow has been globalized, but it faces some severe historical inequalities that have not changed. And these are inequalities between people and between economic potential. And they, they have grown out of previous industrial, previous technological revolutions, especially the industrial age. Now, with regard to the economy, we have globalized goods and capital. We have not globalized the flow of labor and of people in general. Again, people, that is a little bit what is still missing in the globalization. And finally, talking about the social construction. So actually, who is representing the representatives of the people and is the United Nations structure that we have right now, how functional is it to actually represent whom and, uh, and to what degree and how functionally is it and how much reform is needed there? Now, I'm, I'm very proud that I've worked for the United Nations and I really strongly believe in it. It's the only table we ever came up with. Look, before that, we were in kingdoms and thiefdoms and whatever. So it is a big advancement, but it also has to be recognized that, you know, it's pretty unstable and it's unfinished. So while we talk about global digital policies or, or innovations, we have to recognize the unfinished business and unstable situation that we have here globally. So then what to do about that? The international internationality of digital networks. Well, the best you have is international coordination. And if you look at our cube framework, in our cube framework, well, you have basically cubes of different different sizes of different dimensions. You have the world summits or you have international organizations, for example, ICANN, the International Corporation for the Assignment of Names and Numbers. That's an, actually an NGO that's located here in California. That is a global organization that is in charge of internet governance, actually. It's interesting that it's a non-governmental organization. Now, what about global AI governance? That's one of the very hot debates right now. And there are some partnerships emerging, pushed by some countries, but I don't know, how will we manage globally the AI algorithmification revolution? There's no clear answer right now, but we do know that digital networks don't naturally stop at national borders. So it would be very useful if you would have a dialogue there. But then you also have regional dialogues and you have national agendas and you have local ones here at the university. Also the University of California, we have a digital agenda, for example. And also even in your household, you can have digital agendas. And in your family and how children are connected or adults are connected. And then they're actually parallel to each other. So basically, long story short, you have cubes 
wooden cubes. That's more like the Russian Matryoshka dolls that you have inside. But then you have also some parallel among them, and all of them at the end need to be need to be coordinated. So they I leave you with some of the particularities of digital development and they said, well, there's first of all the uncertainty of the trajectory. The antidote here is to have short-term flexibility, never plan too long. Exponential progress goes impressively, surprisingly fast. The all pervasiveness, so you're gonna step on many different toes. So also just recognize it from the beginning and have a decentralized approach with broad input. The unpredictability, be humble and recognize that you won't be able to catch everything. So consult with the experts, get specialized deep input. And last but not least, be aware that usually when you do something in the digital real, it does go globally. So you need to also recognize where things are with regard to our unfinished business of globalization. And with these reflections, I leave you. Thank you very much for being with me here on this tour de force through the digital age, digital technology and social change landscape. Well, all I can say is thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did.